Media literacy is defined by Smaldino as understanding how the various types of media produce meaning. Students should be able to consume media in all forms. In other words, they need to be able to comprehend these forms and not just read them. They should be able to make connections and analyze them. Along with consuming media, they should also be able to produce these different forms as well. They need to be able to distinguish the different ways to use each media and be able to utilize the correct one with whatever purpose they set forth. Smaldino lists the several advantages to using multimedia and only a couple of limitations. I thought this was interesting. The advantages are interactive, individualization, special needs, information management, and multisensory experiences. The use of multimedia in learning is interactive and engages the students, which in turn results in student learning. Multimedia is also effective with students who have special needs by allowing them to work at their own pace. The only two limitations that Smaldino lists for multimedia and learning is availability and cost of materials and storage of materials. Although these are only two limitations, they are both critical in the use of multimedia. Many schools in our area, including my own, do not have the financial ability to purchase some of the materials. It is up to the teachers to research and find low-cost programs or free materials to use in our classrooms. I have come across the second disadvantage, storage, several times. Students work on research papers or book projects and oftentimes they can't afford their own flash drives, so I usually purchase extra ones out of pocket so that they are able to save their work. Once the school year is over, I delete all items and reuse the flash drive the following year. Although the disadvantages listed are pretty common, I think the advantages way outweigh them. I believe our students need to be engaged in order for them to learn. There are four types of learning centers listed on page 260 to 261 of ITML. Skill centers allow for extra practice on a specific skill. If a student is having trouble using the dictionary, students could use the skill center to provide to practice dictionary skills. Interest centers prompt students to find new interests and facilitate creativity. If a teacher is going to cover a unit on the Civil War, this center could be used as a way to show photos and images that represent that particular era. This center can also be used to activate prior knowledge or to create the background knowledge they will need for a new lesson or concept. Remedial centers can serve students who are having trouble with fluency, for example, this center could allow the student to use the computer for iStation. iStation is an online reading program that promotes reading skills. The last one is enrichment centers, which are useful for students who have finished their work and have extra time. The idea of utilizing these learning centers in the classroom has been something I've wanted to do, but I find that I never have the time to plan. Do any of you all use learning centers? If so, how? Do you use one or all? And are there any programs you would recommend for any of the centers? According to Smaldino, there are three types of manipulatives, real objects, models, and mock-ups. An example of a real object that I have used in the past is a record player. When we read Watson's Go to Birmingham 1963 by Christopher Paul Curtis at the end of the school year, I bring my little record player that I owned as a little girl. I show them the records and will play a few seconds of a couple of songs so that they can hear the difference in sound. I am finding that fewer and fewer students know what a record player is and it helps for them to see it and hear it with their own eyes and ears. I shared my example of a real object. Do any of you have any have other examples of any of the manipulatives in the classroom that you would like to share? The final form of multimedia that I will be discussing is display. The different form forms of display surfaces that Smaldino discusses on page 266 to 270 are whiteboards, interactive whiteboards, bulletin boards, cloth and magnetic boards, and flip charts, anchor charts. All classrooms in our school have required bulletin boards. These consist of a word wall for academic vocabulary, a communications board for important announcements, and a data wall for the display of attendance data and assessment analysis data. I do not use cloth or magnetic boards, although our whiteboards foster the use of magnets. The last one that Smaldino lists is flip charts. I use flip charts several times throughout a lesson. Once I complete a chart or illustration, I post them up on my walls in the classroom and leave them posted for the remainder of the year. Since our standards spiral throughout the year, it is helpful to refer to these anchor charts for review. I use a lot of color in my anchor charts, which is one of the advantages that Smaldino discusses on page 271. Another advantage is that anchor charts can be used for all levels of learning. The limitations that are listed are lack of attention to proper use, which is usually what happens when teachers don't utilize them with the care and attention they demand. The second disadvantage is need for careful thought and planning. Teachers should focus on only one objective for each chart. It would probably confuse the students if there were several objectives or topics on one chart. Do any of your schools require certain bulletin boards or displays?